All right, guys, welcome back. Here we are, Lesson 57. You're still with us. I'm still with you. Praise the Lord. It's Leviticus, and it's Leviticus all week long. Now, I, I know we've talked about this, especially last week, about when you're going through, reading through the Bible in one year or now in two years, you're kind of like, when do I normally quit this whole thing, right? It's usually in the book of Leviticus. And I got to tell you, I'm excited because as I kept studying this more and more and more, I, I kept seeing it. It's bringing it to life for me. The Word of God is, is taking Leviticus and it's pointing to, I'm telling you, the Messiah. Everywhere you look, our one word, the atonement, it's here. We're going to hear it today and tomorrow and the next day. This whole week on the book of Leviticus. Now, remember, just yesterday we talked about Leviticus 9 and it was kind of, uh, it was Aaron's first day on the job. What, Kevin, do you remember why it would be his first day on the job? Do you remember what he did yesterday? Uh, he was going through all the... Um sacrifices. Yeah, he, he did all of his offerings, right? He went through this whole process of the sin offering and the burnt offering. That was the sins for himself. And then he went through the fellowship offering and the grain offering, and that's covering all of the Israelite stuff. And then remember Aaron actually blessed the people. And then as the scripture continues, then Moses and Aaron, the brothers, I, I love the dynamics of the brothers. They're coming out and they're at the tent of the meeting and then they bless everybody. So now there's two blessings in Leviticus 9. And then the best, the, the, it, it just, it heightens the fire falls. Remember, we have the glory and the fire and how both of those actually point to the coming of the Messiah. You can be in his presence and now we can look forward to the glory and the fire. It's, it's an incredible picture. Now, on the eighth day, all of this took place. Remember, for seven days, they were quiet. Do you remember this? They had to sit there and rest in, in all of this. And in fact, in Exodus, Kevin, can you go there in 28 verse four, the priests were given the garments. And I think this is important to know how do we transition into uh, Leviticus 10 and Exodus 28, 4. Look at it says, it says, they're to make holy garments for your brother Aaron and his sons. We're going to talk about Aaron's sons today. So now remember, they're given the garments. Now, Kevin, if you would go to Leviticus 8, verse 30. In Leviticus 8, verse 30, what you're going to see is again, God's hand is on Aaron. God's hand is on his sons. And then it says here, it's pretty cool. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil, some of the blood that was on the altar, and then sprinkled, Kevin, sprinkled, not thrown, sprinkled, <laughs> sprinkled them on Aaron and his garments, as well as, look, the oil and the blood was also sprinkled on his sons and their garments. In this way, he consecrated Aaron and his garments, as well as his sons and their garments. And so, I'm, okay, here you have in Leviticus 8, the sons have been ordained. The sons have been anointed to do the work of the Lord. They just saw literally their father walk through the offerings. They just saw the fire of God fall from heaven. It says in verse 1 of Leviticus 10, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, each took his own fire pan, put fire in it, placed incense on it, and presented unauthorized fire. Nope, fire's not authorized. Like, it's kind of a weird phrase. This strange scripture calls it strange fire, unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them to do. Now, I'm going to go over here to the screen for a second. This whole thing, the tabernacle, it's one big commandment, is it not? Like, Moses, I need you to do all of this. And, and then there's little things in between in order to get to the brazen altar, in order to get to the brazen lover. All of these things, like, it's constantly being commanded. And you wonder sometimes if these guys are like, I'm tired of these commandments already. Like, I've heard enough from my dad. You know, sometimes you wonder, how many times have you ever heard about the pastor's kids? Oh, you're a PK? Oh, and they're kind of rebellious sometimes. If you're around the ministry long enough, sometimes they get fried by it. Sometimes they get annoyed by it. And I just want to humanize this. I don't know if that's Nadab and Abahu's mentality. I just know they're like, I'm doing what I want to do. And, what, and it didn't go so well for them. And it says in verse two, then fire came from the Lord. So they used unauthorized fire. They used their own fire pans. They used their own incense. They put all of this stuff and it says fire came down from the Lord and burned them to death before the Lord. Thus, end of the story. <laughs> Boom. You're just like, dear Lord, Lord, you could have gone. Here's what I think is really interesting about why he didn't take it easy on them. Now, this is the precedent right here. Like if you're going to play and go against my commandments, you know what's going to happen? You're done kind of like the Lord just said, I don't want anybody else to do what Nadab and Abihu did ever again. And so he said, I'm, I'm just going to destroy them. And I'm going to give you a couple things here. And I think this is really bizarre. And if you would, I'm going to go along. You guys know our good friend uh, Warren Wearsby over here. He, he described this whole situation in Leviticus 10 and how Nadab and Abihu, they went wrong. Well, now, first of all, you got to understand these guys, they were the wrong people to be even doing this. It's for the high priest, not the priest. It's for their father, Aaron, not 
not for themselves. And in fact, Kevin, if you would go to Exodus 30, verse 7, uh, 8, 9, and 10. But Exodus 30, verse 7, it, they're the wrong people. So that's a problem in itself. So if you go to Exodus 30, verse 7, Aaron must bring, must burn fragrant, fragrant incense on it. He must burn it every morning when he tends the lamps. In verse 8, when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he must burn incense. There is to be an incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. Verse 9, you're not, uh, you must not offer unauthorized incense on it. We'll get into that, but there's some of that pictures already. Or a burnt or a grain offering. You're not to pour a drink offering on it. And then in verse 10, uh, once a year, Aaron is to perform the purification right on the horns of the altar. So to me, it looks like Aaron's supposed to be doing it, the high priest, not the son. So that, that's one thing. All right, let's go back to Leviticus. Another problem is, is that they use the wrong instruments. <laughs> now, I'm not talking like musical instruments. They, they use their own. They, they brought their own fire pan. Hey, do you think the wife will notice if I take the fire pan today? Hey, where'd you go, Nadab? Oh, just cooking some eggs. I mean, like, what an odd conversation. Like, he brought the wrong instruments. They're not supposed to use their own in Exodus. Um, let's try Exodus 40, verse 9, Kevin. Let's try it. Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it along with all of its furnishings so that it will be holy. So if, <laughs> if he brings in the fire pan from Nadab's house, right? that little Jimmy uses every once in a while to make eggs before he goes to school. It's probably not consecrated or probably not anointed. So you got the wrong people, wrong instruments. Now, and I love what Weersby says here, uh, you got the wrong time. You know, you just wanna, I don't know, this would probably be a good time and the Lord's probably like, you idiots, what are you doing? Like, this is not right. Remember, it's the day of atonement. Once a year, guys, I, I think I want you to get this right, Leviticus 16, 11. Leviticus 16, 11 is the mentality. Wrong people, wrong instruments, and wrong time. Uh, scripture says, when Aaron presents the bull for a sin offering and makes atonement for himself, this is called, and his household, this is called the day of atonement. So they have the wrong people, wrong instruments, wrong time. Now, where's me? He's not done. He also says, ah, they came under the wrong authority. They didn't come with God's authority. They came with their own little game plan. Hey, hey, Abahu. Yeah, let's try something. Let's, let's make our own fire. Like, <laughs> let's see if we can get away with it. It's kind of a weird thing to do on the first day on the job. You know, I'd can their rears. In fact, God, you know what he did? He fired them. <laughs> Genius. That's where this came from. Wow. Man, that's so natural. That's so fun. All right, so you got wrong people, wrong instruments, wrong time, wrong authority. And then we just talked about this, but they brought the wrong fire. They brought the wrong fire. We know this, but uh, in Leviticus, uh, Kevin, if you would, hang on here one second. I just think this is crazy to me. Um, yeah, go to Leviticus 16. Well, it's Leviticus 16. It's the Day of Atonement mentality again. Leviticus 16, verse 12. Uh, but again, it's this whole, uh, the, the, you must take a fire pan full of fiery coals from the altar before the Lord. So do you get this? So you're going to take the fire, okay, that's already here. Remember the fire that fell from heaven, the fire that fell down? I want you to take a fire pan full of those kernels, uh, kernels, coals, <laughs> popcorn today, right? <laughs> they're taking the fiery coals and then they're bringing it. But it's like they just, right? We've done this before. They, they're, they're starting their own, they're starting their own fire. Oh man, I wonder, I wonder if at any point they're like, you know, I wonder if this is a bad idea. You guys think they thought that? It's totally premeditated. No, they didn't think that. No, they thought they had it right. All right, so here's another thing, all right? Uh, wrong motive, okay? Nadab and Abihu, they have, they just got it all wrong everywhere you look at it. In Leviticus 10.3, can you go there? Leviticus 10.3, it, it's interesting to me. Leviticus 10.3, uh, it just says, watch this. This is what the Lord meant when he said, I will show my holiness to those who are near me and I will reveal my glory before all the people. Who gets the glory when they try to do this? They're trying. Nadab and Abihu are trying to get their own glory. The Lord says, that, that glory is for me. This is my deal. And I'm not going to put up with it. And so God just, yeah, well, he kills them. So, and the next thing, finally, I think this is interesting. And Jeff, you and I were talking about this uh, before we started today. I think they came to the table with the wrong energy. There's a really good chance, you guys, uh, that these guys came to the table completely drunk. Okay, 
first day on the job, coming drunk, get fired, die. Like, didn't work out so well for these guys. But now, here, here's where I want to I want to go somewhere with this. In Leviticus 10, verse 9, if you'll go there, Kevin. So the Lord's speaking to Aaron. This is where this is where a lot of the commentators would, would take this. You and your sons are not to drink wine or beer when you enter the tent of meeting, or else you will die. Right then and there says, maybe that's the cause of their whole death. I mean, wouldn't you say that that could probably be the case? If you come to the table drinking wine or drinking beer, hey, you know, whatever, uh, they came to the table with the wrong energy. They're depending upon alcohol. And the Lord just said, man, if you do it again, you're, just so you know, you're going to die. And so just to talk a little bit about the, the alcohol mentality, like we're not supposed to hang our hat on the alcohol. And so we'll unfold that in a little bit. But to me, I think this is an incredible story. And so if you go to verse three, now all of a sudden you have two sons that are dead. Uh, Leviticus 10, three. So Moses says to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, I will show my holiness to those who are near me and I will reveal my glory before all the people. But Aaron remained silent. Why do you guys think he was quiet? There are two sons. His two sons just dead and, and Aaron doesn't respond. You guys got anything? I think he's one, probably a little dumbfounded. Might be scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> Remorseful, maybe a little bit. I mean, I just lost my two sons. They burned up in a fire. Did something wrong. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not talking right now. <laughs> well, there's some some translations say he, he kept his peace, which is interesting. You know, uh, a lot of people also will say this is that this is the first day on the job. He's not going to mess up and screw up his responsibilities. And so I think there's this this image, this mentality of yeah, my my sons are dead. It's almost a shock factor. It's a shock factor, and then he's just going to, I don't know if you guys know people that have lost people or that somebody has died, and for a season, they just kind of almost go through life still, like almost like nothing has changed. Does that make sense? And, and then eventually it hits them, and we're going to get into that, but he has a responsibility, and, and he has to continue to, to maintain this. Kevin, can you go to James, uh, James 3, 1? And I want to walk through, but I, I'm telling you, we all have been given a responsibility. The question is, is what are we going to do with this? And so James, uh, in the book of James in the New Testament, not many should become teachers. Why? My brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. Nadab and Abihu, they already were being held to a different standard. And the problem was, is that that standard they weren't living up to. Praise the Lord, you guys, in the new covenant, we don't have to live like that. Does that make sense? Yes, this is for us. But my point is God's not going to just kill us because, oh, man, I, 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 uh, I said a swear word today. Or, oh, man, I, whatever. You get the point. Like, there's, there's grace today. Praise the Lord. But we do need to have this, and I need to have this, especially as a teacher. I'm being held accountable more than others at this point. Okay, but let's keep going here because if we're not careful, this will lead to a fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 10, Verse 12, it, it, to me, this is, a, uh, this is where we're at, and this is exactly what happens. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. To me, this is exactly what happened to Nadab and Be uh, uh, Abihu. Like, I got it. We're good. We're the priests. We can get away with whatever we want. I got it. In fact, this is where sin really begins to, to creep in. Just when you think you're walking in this pride, that's when it leads to the fall. I think that's exactly what happened in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. And then one more. I think this is not meant to be funny, but it is a little bit tongue in cheek. Kevin, if you would go to Hebrews 12, verse 28. This is what, this is what I think happened to these guys. Hebrews 12, verse 28. Scripture just says this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us hold on to God's grace. And I love that because it doesn't say let us hold on to ourselves. <laughs> Let us hold on to God's grace. By it, we may serve God acceptably. So when we hold on to the grace that's been given to us, then we can serve God acceptably with reverence and all, because we're not doing it in our own strength. And now watch in verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. What I think happened at Nadab and Abihu, they did it in their own strength. And then guess what? Oh, they, they experienced a consuming fire, all right. They're dead. Like, to me, this is unbelievable. And it's a cool picture, though, isn't it? About depending upon God's grace in order to experience his fire. And so, Kevin, if you would, let's go back to Leviticus 10, uh, specifically verse 4. Here's the deal. Moses uh, is now into the picture. Moses summoned Mishael and Eli Eliezphan, <laughs> sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, all right? So there's a whole lot of family going on here. And said to them, come here and carry your relatives. You know what that means, right? I need you to be the pallbearers and pick up the dead. 
I need you to carry your dead family members away from the front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. So there's this image that we've been talking about constantly. Take it outside the camp. Take it outside the camp. Now, here's a question. Why, why not the family do this? Why not the immediate family? Because they would become unclean. Absolutely. Go to Leviticus 21, 1 and 2. Kevin, you're on your A game today. And that's a nice shirt you got there today, Kevin. Leviticus 21. What are you... Nice shirt. It looks Kevin. good. It looks good, Kevin. Leviticus. Oh, Michelle picked it out, I bet. <laughs> Can you go to Leviticus 21 for me while we're complimenting you, though? 21 what? Verse 1. 21, 1. 21, verse 1. Uh, just uh, the image of this unclean. The Lord said to Moses, speak to Aaron's sons, the priests, and tell them, a priest is not to make himself ceremonially unclean for a dead person among his relatives. Which is, so just this imagery of, hey, be careful about who you surround yourself. And now go to verse 2 because I want to really add some confusion to this except for his immediate family, his mother, father, son, daughter, or brother. Huh. But he still would have become unclean. He still would have been unclean. But you're not supposed to do it if it's outside of that. Correct. So it's an interesting perspective. So now they got family. They're, they're coming to the table. Now, can I just tell you this, though? Um, the responsibility card. Like, you know how we've been all entrusted with stuff? Moses isn't perfect either, you guys. Aaron did the golden calf. And then what happened to Aaron? He's now the high priest. So Aaron's the high priest. He messes up. Moses, we know eventually in Numbers 30, guess what? He messes up and he doesn't get into the promised land. So there's these images of, in fact, can you go to 1 Samuel 6, 19? 1 Samuel 6, 19. There's these images of people messing up. And here, here's all I want to do just for your discussion groups. Here's all I want to do for your interactions with your family at home or just maybe on the road in the car. Like, I don't understand how God chooses when he strikes them down and when he doesn't. I just, that's all I want to say. It says in 1 Samuel 6, 19, God struck down the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked inside the ark of the Lord. He struck down 70 men out of 50,000. The people mourned because the Lord struck them with a great slaughter. Well, a great slaughter to me is taking out 50,000. 70 men, why those 70? You know, why those 70? Why all of a sudden Nadab and Abihu? Why all of a sudden Moses can't go into the promised land, but Aaron is still appointed the high priest? And I, I'm, I'm bringing that up because it doesn't make sense to me. You guys have any thoughts? You know, in Scripture it talks about that God disciplines those that He loves. Yeah. And sometimes as a father, you kind of bring the smack down to teach yeah. your kids a lesson. And in the long run, we get the benefit of learning the lesson of God's heart behind it. But um, those people didn't really learn the lesson. <laughs> so I, I just think it's an in, in, interesting image of the Old Testament how God uses people as examples, that I am going to hold you to a different standard, and then we, we use those standards on how we live our life. And unfortunately, when you're the first timers doing this, no more second chances. So anyway, in verse 5 of Leviticus 10, uh, it says, They came forward, carried them, the family members came them, carried them in their tunics outside the camp, as Moses had said. Now in verse 6 of Leviticus 10, then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, do not let your hair hang loose. I need you, is what he's saying, to comb your hair. That's what he said. Make sure you're, you're kept together and do not tear your garments. Don't look like a mess, like, or else you'll die. And the Lord will become angry with the whole community. However, your brothers, the whole house of Israel, may mourn over the tragedy when the Lord sent the fire. Guys, I don't have time for you right now for you to mourn. That's what he's saying. I don't have time for you to mourn right now over your son, over your brothers. Let the community do it. You've got to serve the house of Israel. He's kind of like, that doesn't seem right. In fact, in verse 7, you must not go outside uh, to the tent, uh, to the entrance to the tent of the meeting, or you will die. I can't have you leave, for the Lord's anointing oil is on you. Isn't that interesting? They just lost a son and brothers, and he says, and you better get to work. But God, don't you understand? Like, I have family to take care of. I got to take care of my wife. I got to take care of this, everybody that's dealing with this. And the calling is bigger. You ready for this one? Than your family. God's calling on your life is bigger than your family. It's a pretty forward statement, but Scripture, I think, can prove that, up, prove that pretty well. Luke 9, Kevin, if you would. Go to Luke 9, verse 59. And here's the deal, you guys. And we see this all the time in ministry. I think all of us would say this. When we lose people, okay, I don't know how else to describe this, it's usually because of family. 
There's something coming on in tugging at our hearts with the family. Now, here's what you got to say, you guys. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my kids. We would all say that. But the scriptures are pretty clear. Look in Luke 9, 59. Then he said to another, follow me. Lord, he said, let, first let me go bury my, my father. And then in verse 60, but he said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. And all throughout scripture, he almost makes this tension of family and the kingdom of God and family and the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, that's not my family. My family is the, is the body of Christ. My family is, is the kingdom of God. And yet sometimes in America, overseas, I don't know, it might be a little bit different. I, we elevate our family to the point, you guys, where we sometimes are skewed with what the Lord's calling us to do. And the craziest thing is, is that just when Aaron uh, has been called, he kills two of his sons and he says, and I want you to stay focused on the work I've called you to do this. That's pretty forward. And it's pretty harsh. But when you come over to the tabernacle, you guys, all of a sudden I have two million, I need two million people that want to experience the presence of God and you want to go mourn over your kids. No, no, no. I need you to bring the presence to, I need you to have them experience my presence. So like he always has a bigger picture, but we don't, do we? Sometimes it's hard when, when I go to Indiana uh, because I, I miss my family. And so it's easy to weigh out this tension of like, you know, I'm just, I, I need this to be home. I think this is the mentality that I, this is me personally, that I have to fight through. I have to wrestle. And I'm telling you, that's a tension that is constantly throughout the scriptures. Do we not all feel this? Yeah. yeah. Every one of us feels this. And you don't have to be a missionary to feel this tension, you guys. You know, some of you might be wrestling with, well, hey, should I start a new community group? Should I start a new discussion group? Well, that might take time away from my family. But if the Lord's calling you to advance the kingdom of God, it's okay to take two hours away from your family. But we rationalize all, all of this stuff. And I'm right there with you. And I just think it's an interesting image that he says, by the way, you have work to do. God's anointing oil is on you. Wow. And then he says in verse 8 of Leviticus 10, that Lord spoke to Aaron. He says, all right, Aaron, look, he doesn't say this part, but I want him to be like, I, I know you, Aaron. I know you messed up with, I know you messed up with the golden calf. And oh, by the way, I know you're going to speak against my, my servant Moses down the road with your sister. And I know that you're going to reveal that you're probably not the greatest parent. Look what just happened here. Like there's things that God has in, in store, but he's not done with them. And in verse nine, he says, you and your sons aren't to drink wine or beer when you enter the tent of meeting or else you'll die. And this is a permanent statue throughout your generation. So in other words, what that means is you can't change this right here in two months. You can't be like, all right, guys, let's bring the Corona. It's like you can't change that mentality. Is that right? A Corona? Like, like I even know. Rich? <laughs> yeah, that would be correct. Now watch this in verse 10. Why? Why is this important? Because you must be able to distinguish between the holy and the common. You need to distinguish between the clean and the unclean. I'm about to tell you some stuff that in Leviticus, there is a laundry list of duties that you have to do. And I got to have you have a clear mind. I can't have you drinking on the job. <laughs> it didn't work out for your sons. Okay, I get it, Lord. And then in verse 10, look, uh, verse 11, by the way, besides distinguishing between the holy and the common and the clean and the unclean, he says, and you're going to teach the Israelites all the statutes that the Lord has given to them through Moses. I think the thing that's going to be exhausting this whole week is all of the statutes that we go through. I'm sorry, which, which bird can I not eat from? Oh, none of them. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I eat a weasel? No, you can't eat a weasel. Like you have to, who wants to eat a weasel anyway? Like the whole point is, is I need you to be in your A game, in the right frame of mind. And I got to have you teach all the Israelites. And so I don't have time for you to right now to mourn. That's, that's crazy though. I need you to decipher between the holy and the common, the clean and the unclean. And so then, man, I would just be processing all of this. Like, wow. You know, it makes me think the priests have to have the gift of discernment, don't they? They, they got to discern what this environment looks like. And so, Kevin, can you go to Hebrews 5, verse 14? I feel like the Lord has given me the gift of discernment. It's, it's in, the, in 1 Corinthians when Paul talks about these gifts. And it's pretty cool. 1 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 14, if you would. Uh, it just says this, but solid food. Okay, go back to verse 13. I'll go to 13. Uh, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he's an infant. Now watch what it says in verse 14. It's pretty cool. So you're talking about the milk and the meat, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have senses who have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Like we have a role in the area of discernment that we need to start discerning between good and evil. The priests are an incredible model for that. 
between the holy and the common, the clean and the unclean. Because what you're going to learn about the tabernacle, what you're going to learn about the priesthood is, is that they are making themselves distinct than any other nation. And anywhere else in the world, these people are different because they're functioning in a function of, of, of holiness. And I need you as the priest to model this more than ever. What you're going to see through 12 through 15 is that you're going to start seeing the offerings that are going to be taking place. You're going to say the, the grain offering. Then we're going to start seeing, uh, the, you know, the, the wave offering. Right, guys, when they take their food and wave it up in the air, they, got a, they have a breast and a thigh here just waving it up, you know, and just kind of a weird thing to say, the fat portions. Hey, here it is. And then in verse 16, if you'll go there, Kevin, uh, and then, then it says he takes this, this male goat. Uh, and it begins to unfold more and more here about what these offerings take place. Because of time, um, I really, I don't want to go there. I just, I want you to understand. Uh, I want to go to verse 19, though, if you can, Kevin. Okay, verse 19. Uh, you know what, though? Let me do this. I, I do need to back up here. Go to verse 17, Kevin, if you would. Moses is talking, right? And he says, why didn't you eat the sin offering in the sanctuary area? So he's talking to his brother. OK, uh, and he says, for it's especially holy and he has assigned it to you to take away the guilt of the community and make atonement for them. Since his blood was not brought inside the sanctuary, you should have eaten it in the sanctuary area as I commanded. So Moses says, look, guys, you were supposed to do it this way. And I, I want to know why, why you didn't. And then in verse 19, Aaron replied to Moses's accusations about not doing it correctly. He says, see, today they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. And since these things have happened to me, if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been acceptable in the Lord's sight? So Moses raises an issue. Aaron, you didn't do it right already. You didn't do it. And Aaron, it says he's not in the mood. And I love what Constable says. Well, he, he couldn't eat the offering with a good conscience. He couldn't eat the offering. Remember, that was part of the priest's payment. I couldn't eat in a good conscience. In fact, I wasn't going to try to fool God. And so I just decided, instead of trying to fool God, I just decided to fast. So Aaron just flat out said, I'm not hungry. I'm not going to eat. Why? Because he lost his son. So he still maintained what he could. But I'm just going to tell you, but Aaron didn't do all of it right. He banked on God looking at his heart, saying, God, I'm here. I'm going to do the best I can. I just give me time so I can get my mind right. Just give me time. You see, God wants the obedience, not the sacrifice. And I think what you saw with Aaron is, is that he's going to do the role and he's going to do it well. It just it doesn't always look perfect. <laughs> and so when you walk out this calling that he has for your lives, he understands that this is a serious responsibility. He understands it's a serious calling. But I just want to encourage all of you, as you walk this calling out, just breathe. <laughs> just know you're going to mess up. But if your intent is to serve the Lord and your heart is to serve the Lord, he's going to extend grace. And that's what he does with Aaron. He does not with the sons. He does it with Aaron. All right, that is Leviticus 10. Wrong people, wrong instruments, wrong time, wrong authority, wrong fire, wrong motive, wrong energy. <laughs> and they're dead. And Aaron has to learn from this. And he has to use this example. And he has to serve the people of Israel. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you tomorrow.